What's going on in our nation's capital in the aftermath of the RNC, those protests, the block parties and politicians just in general being sleazy and untrustworthy from an inside the beltway position. We've got Tina Lowe in the mix. She is a commentary writer at the Washington Examiner, also a contributor to The First. Tina, what's up? Hey, Buck. How's life in D.C.? Because life in New York is turning into a, a dystopian, you know, frozen food and Amazon Prime and Netflix watching nightmare, effectively. Like, that's never going to stop until the election. How are you guys doing down there? So it's been funny to see on Twitter all of these journalists tweeting from their Capitol Hill balconies and lofts. You know, everything looks peachy keen on their uh, six-figure income streets. When in reality, much of downtown has been completely decimated. In small part, this is just due to people working from home. So the business district downtown is just completely vacated. There's a there's an industry group that was trying to figure out what the vacancy rate was, and it's in it's a it's within ten percent of bi- of normal business activity compared to this month last year. So it's pretty awful. That's not even including the actual rioting and looting that's been going on in Chinatown, which is also downtown. I mean, again, if you get out of the bubble, you can see it right there. I have posted photos of it on Twitter. Um, you know, it's it, it's an interesting world where you can't send your kids to school, go to church. I, I have a friend who cannot go into his doctor's, who cannot go into his wife's OBGYN appointments to see her ultrasounds. Um, but you can just throw a block party in the street in the name of social justice. So that's where we're at right now. I'm, I, you know, I can't use words like shock or surprise because these days, a lot of the blue check libs in particular, there's nothing, there's nothing that's beneath them in these political fights. I mean, there's nothing they won't say, but you probably ha- have seen some of this. Uh, I saw the CNN correspondent that I always refer to. He's like the FBI pajama boy. Uh, who now is out in Portland, he takes a photo of a park and says, no crazy Antifa here. Everything looks just fine. Uh, You have Paul Krugman tweeting out, I think it was just this morning, went for a run in New York City. No black clad Antifa lunatics attacking me. Like everything is just fine. And, you know, posts a photo of of being in Central Park or something. I mean, I I hate to break these people, but I've been in war zones like in the worst periods of the city of Mosul's history during the Iraq war, when there were people getting their heads lopped off in public squares on video, you could find quiet streets where things looked. I mean, like, I I don't understand how it's possible that people like Paul Krugman and the Nobel laureate are so dumb, but I I guess people don't care. It would be like finding a black person who hasn't been shot by a cop and saying, Oh, Black Lives Matter is over. We don't need to do this anymore. When that's insane. We understand that anecdotal evidence isn't everything. And furthermore, we know these crime stats in these cities are skyrocketing. New York crime, what, last month nearly doubled. Tripled, or, tripled? Yeah, it doubled. Yeah, yeah in, in Los Angeles, it was up some like 30%, I believe. And then I don't think anyone would consider editorializing to show these photos of Portland and of Seattle and of Kenosha and realize that, yeah, we're, we're literally burning entire cities to the ground, sizable portions of them. And then, you know, you have this fun faction of our totally out of touch media class saying, oh, don't worry, the insurance will cover the, the lootings and the riots. Not when you file a six figure insurance claim, these are usually capped in the five figures. And also on top of that, it means that then that these small businesses insurance rates are going to go up indefinitely. Yeah, I mean, just looking at the, at the data that we do have and the data that we don't, Tina, it's very clear there have been some independent journalists who have gone out on the road and done some actual fact finding. And you see that there are, are, are neighborhoods where there's the businesses that are burned down. And then there's also the businesses around the businesses that are burned down that have no customers, that have been on lockdown for months, that can't pay their rent, and now they're on land that's effectively because they can't afford to even remove the rubble of the burned-down business. Now the land of that business is worth almost nothing because who's going to sign the next lease there, right? Who's going to be the person that wants to take over that space? 
So the, the second and third order effects of the destruction that's happening, whether it's in Kenosha or Portland or, or parts of other major cities that we're seeing, it, it's so clear to anyone who thinks this through, but you, you have Nobel laureates like Paul Krugman, who write for the New York Times, saying the, the, they can't decide whether it's everything is fine or all the terrible stuff is Trump's fault, which I think is a fascinating yeah, no. dichotomy. The, it, it, the riots are Trump's fault, and also there are no riots. That's basically what it comes down to. You know, I mean, I don't even live in the worst hit area of D.C., but my street had multiple buildings looted. I went to my bodega right next to my apartment, owned solely by minority immigrants. I talked to the owner, and he says, I want justice, too. But they're never going to get it because it's not the en vogue cause du jour. And it, I mean, and also in a sane world, you have these independent journalists like Andy No, like Julio Rosas, like, like everyone at the Daily Caller, who they were going into these literal war zones, giving us coverage because the New York Times can't send a fleet of reporters to do the same. Instead, they're all running cover for these rioters and looters. I mean, Nicole Hannah-Jones is the one who said property violence is not violence. Yeah, no, and there's there's open justification now of looting in some quarters. You'll see that they'll they'll rationalize the looting, and that was I think an NPR editorial from from over the weekend. And there's even a whole book on how you know looting is an important part of the justice movement. We're speaking to Tina Lowe, commentary writer at the Examiner and contributor to the First. Uh, Tina, the part of this that that I think is is still remains to be seen how it's going to play out. I'm curious for your take on it. The, the Democrats seem to reckon they've got a cognitive dissonance here. They seem to recognize that the law and order problem now is a problem for them. But I, I can't tell if the the Democrat apparatus, meaning the media, the DNC, the Biden campaign fully knows how they're going to play this now. You know, yesterday, Biden's yeah. not going to Kenosha. Today, he is going to Kenosha. Yesterday, Trump causes the riots. Today, they've got you know, big name blue checks on social media saying, what riots? This cities look great, right? What do you think? Well, clearly the internal polling is in and now it's external. You know, think about it. Just as with the school reopenings that every single Democrat in the country changed their tune and their media adversaries and allies. Um, this is what's going on with the caring finally about law and order. You know, this has been going on for three months. Portland is on their 100th night of rioting and it has taken this long for biden and quite frankly you know i think that i've been a pretty sympathetic conservative towards biden but that speech that he gave in pennsylvania that was weak tea his i mean that was that was both sides that was all lives mattering the issue right now the issue is not about the white nationalists at charlottesville yes the issue was the white nationalists right now the issue are these far left antifa rioters and Clearly, they're trying to have their cake and eat it, too, because it is deeply affecting their polls. Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, these are states where Trump's numbers have all slowly risen again. And even if you look at Black Lives Matter support polling, immediately after the killing of George Floyd, American support for BLM increased more in, the two, in those two weeks than it had in the 21 months prior. And that included a massive jump among Republicans. You had Tim Scott, who wanted to do a sweeping police reform bill in the Senate. What happened? Democrats killed it. This stopped being about any sort of police reform and started being about burn it all down cultural Marxism. Remember, and now, yeah, it was about Christopher. It was about Christopher Columbus statues about two weeks after uh, they first tried to do the police reform bills. Exactly. So then people just realize very transparently that this is not this is no longer about racial justice in in forms of indiscriminate policing. This is no longer about actual legislative change, actual policy effects. And it is now just it in the woke white liberal left. It's about virtue signaling and it's about showing that that they are a member. Of a, of a different kind of cultural elite because they can no longer signal in terms of economic elitism. And then among the outright Antifa rioters, it's just about destruction. That's all it is. Yeah. Yeah. For some people, actually, remember that uh, that scene in the Batman Begins movie where he says some men just want to see the world burn? It's kind of like that. Yep. No, that's, of course that's what it is. Think about it. Think about the cohort of Antifa 
rioters who are doing this. They don't have kids. They don't have a lot of friends. They don't have church. They don't have careers. Why wouldn't they want to burn it all down? There we go. Tina Lowe, everybody. Check out her latest at the Washington Examiner. And I look for her more on the first. Deanna, thanks so much. Stay safe. Don't go fighting any of those anti faloons. <laughs> thanks, Buck. You have all these libs running around acting like there's nothing bad happening in cities. And then a moment later, they'll tell you that the reason bad things are happening in cities is Donald Trump. That's that's pretty much where it is now. They can't figure out which one they're actually going to go with. It changes. Every, every few moments, it changes. So that's why I, I just want to say right now for, uh, for everybody out there, uh, the cities are in bad shape, folks. We know this. Anyone who lives in one will tell you this. There is nothing trending in their favor. Not security, not the economy, not COVID, nothing. Well, COVID cases, but not COVID lockdowns meaning COVID cases are way, way down, but the lockdowns continue on. What, what's the answer for this? What are they going to do in response to it? Well, Bill de Blasio has got an idea. How about a wealth tax? Oh, yeah, that's right. Bill de Blasio wants help with a wealth tax. Play three. You really want to change things in this city? Then everyone better change a lot of the way we live more foundationally. If you just talk about it and feel self-satisfied, God bless you. That's not actually going to change things. What changes things is redistribution of wealth. Uh, Tax the wealthy at a much higher level. And I just feel like this is a lot of cocktail party comfort going on rather than people honestly dealing with this issue. Help me tax the wealthy. Help me redistribute wealth. Help me build affordable housing in uh, white communities if you want desegregation. (sighs) That's right. Higher taxes, more government housing. That's how de Blasio thinks he's going to fix things. That's how de Blasio thinks he's going to make things better. Well, my friends, it's not going to work. If I weren't someone who had all my family in New York and an interest in the outcome of the fight for the the future, the soul of this city in my work, which I certainly do. If I weren't uh, in that role, I would tell you right now, uh, I'd be out. If it weren't for those two things, I'd be out. The taxes you pay to live in New York City, you know, think about it. If you're making, you know, let's say you're, uh, oh, I don't know, you're somebody who's working in in an office environment, you're an, I, you're an IT specialist for a company. You're making 100, 100 grand, which I don't know if that's high or low for that. Prof- I'm just saying you're making 100 grand. You leave New York City, you don't have to pay New York City taxes anymore. You leave New York State, you don't have to pay New York State taxes anymore. Florida and Texas are very nice places with great people, great food. Same thing with Tennessee. That's why everyone's leaving. Because you, not only do you get to be in a place where you have more freedoms and more rights that are respected, You're also somewhere where you get to keep more of your money. And it's more affordable. So every sandwich you buy, every square foot of your home, all of that, you're getting more for your money. And on top of it, at the end of the year, you get to keep more of your money. And de Blasio's plan is to raise the taxes even more on people who are high earners. De Blasio's plan is to squeeze even harder on the people that he's already getting 50% of the taxes from, the 1% of earners in New York. You know, Democrats, what we're, what we're seeing in part here is that they've been, they've been uh, you know, overusing the golden goose, so to speak, of the major industries that are based in some of these cities, Silicon Valley in California and in the Bay Area, uh, Hollywood uh, for Los Angeles, you know, uh, the whole Hollywood isn't even really a thing anymore. I mean, it is, but it, it doesn't exist the way that it used to. The movie studios are a, a fraction of the power and influence of what they used to have. Now they're making movies for the Chinese market. They're just dubbing them and sending it over to China. That's why everything we see is either a cartoon or a superhero movie now. It's so they can go after the global market. They're not, they don't even care what Americans think about a lot of these movies anymore. So that's completely changed. In New York, you have such a concentration of the financial services industry that's here 
But that's going to change, too. They're going to leave. You know, people hear things like, oh, if you work for Goldman Sachs, you know, you make the average employee at Goldman Sachs make something like, I don't know, $350,000 a year, which sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money. That sounds, I signed me up for that. That sounds great. But if you look at what happens now going forward, if you make $350,000 in New York City, you're not rich. You're not even necessarily very well off. If you're married, you got a couple of kids and, uh, you know, you, you can spend that money very quickly. You're making that kind of money and you live in Tampa, you live in Dallas or Houston. You're doing now. I know those are expensive cities too, Dallas and Houston, but you're, you're doing well. You're living well on that money. You're living well. You're living better on whatever, whether you make 50 grand or 500 grand, you're living better. So people are going to leave. They're going to leave. But de Blasio doesn't understand the basic incentives. And that's why it's only going to get worse. You know, we have all these fleets, these photos of fleets of moving vans and moving trucks. Everyone's trying to get out that can get out. And then that makes things worse for the people who have not gotten out. And it becomes a death spiral of a city. It has happened to other places. It has happened to Detroit. It has happened to Baltimore. It has happened to major American metropolises in the past. You know, you look at a place even like Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a shadow of what it used to be. You know, in terms of the the industry, the commerce, the wealth, it's you know a city with a high with a high crime rate, and you know New New York. I worry the New York golden age is behind it now, and it's because of morons like De Blasio and people like Paul Krugman who are saying, "Oh, I went for a run, and it was a pretty day in New York, and no Antifa attacked me, so everything is okay." You know, there's no way that Krugman is so stupid that he really believes that that's an intelligent thing to say. It's not possible. So he's just being a part of the gaslighting. They're just hoping that they can hold on to these false narratives long enough that when people go in to vote this November, they're not going to believe what has actually happened here. They're going to think something else is going on or they're just going to blame Trump for it. New York City is not Trump's fault. What's going on here? New York State is not Trump's fault. This is on Democrats who have been making the key decisions at every and insisting that they were only their decisions to make. Let's not forget that. Cuomo used to tell the president, sorry, it's a state issue. Back off. Okay. well, there are a lot of people that lived in nursing homes that wish that wish that Cuomo had backed off and left it to somebody else. Because, as I've said, the single most effective, the single best safety policy you could have for your state During the COVID pandemic, don't have Andrew Cuomo as your governor. That would have been the difference between thousands and thousands of people living or dying. Don't have Cuomo as your governor. And if you want your city to survive, don't elect someone like Mayor de Blasio. But who knows who's coming next? Could be even worse. It's time for Roll Call. Time to lay it down for all of you. I got the Godfather in for me tomorrow and Friday because the buck needs a few days off. I guess the buck does stop, but in the grand scheme of things, the buck never stops, but he stops for a couple of days. Going out to Montana. I'm going to go headbutt some grizzlies and grab some rainbow trout with my bare hands. That's how I roll. Don't let this city boy thing fool you. I know how to throw down in the woods. At least I used to. It's been a long time. My skills are probably pretty rusty now. Uh, Producer Mark, what are you doing? Because you are also, uh, you know, Producer Mark doesn't get many days off because I don't get many days off. And so, you know, if I'm going to suffer, he's going to suffer with me. Do you have any fun plans for you and and the wonderful Mrs. Mark? Yeah, the wife and I are uh, getting away for a few days. It should be fun. You want to tell us what state or is this like, uh, you know, you're afraid that the Uh, legions of Team Buck fans are going to track you down? Yeah, I don't need anyone tracking me down when I'm away. I'll let you know on Tuesday where I went. Fair enough. Fair enough. Huh. It's all right. If I see if I see an Instagram though, from I don't know the beaches of Jamaica, we'll know what's up. That's I, I don't think. Uh, first of all, cost, and I don't think I'm allowed in Jamaica right now. I just realized that as I yeah. said it. I don't, I don't even think we're allowed in Canada. Exactly. Can you imagine like a super a super polite Mountie being like, "Oh yeah, I'm so sorry, eh? But uh, yeah, we just you know don't allow Americans in now. You guys are you guys are dirty COVID carriers." That's what's I mean, going on. You joke, but that's actually true. No, that's actually how ha- I know that's actually happening right now. It's kind of it's kind of nuts. If you think about it. You can't go can't go to Canada. 
Um, I wonder when they're going to stop with that. Like, when are we actually going to find out if Americans are welcome anywhere? I'm pretty sure there's a list of places we can go, and it's like North Korea, Zimbabwe, I think Egypt is on it. It's like not a lot of places you want to run to. I got to tell you, Egypt is it was not one of my favorite places I visited. Historical stuff is really cool, but I don't know. I didn't love Egypt. Um, that's probably the best place that I can think of that you're allowed to go right now. I mean, definitely better than North Korea. I don't, I don't hear good things there. So What a choice of vacation, Egypt and North Korea. Yeah, if you, I mean, I'm being serious with at least the list. I don't remember exactly what specific countries you're allowed to go to. I think Iraq, you're, you're still allowed to go. So, oh, thank goodness. Yeah, producer I've been Mark, planning my trip there you. for years. You'd be so good to go. With this audience, though, They would. They, somebody would take you to their, their private range. We'd get you equipped with an M4, an EO tech. We'd get you some training. You'd be good to go, man. We'd put you out there. On, you know, downrange, you'd be fine. It's not worried. And, and, and if, you know, if you did get captured by some remnants of ISIS, I put out the bat signal for Team Buck. They're going to bust producer Mark out of prison over in Iraq. No problem. Our guys as get lovely you. as this all sounds, I think I'm going to pass. You think you're going to pass? Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The Jersey Shore is a nice alternative, I will say. So A little sunnier. Yeah, there's that. Uh, so, yeah. So we got a couple of days off. I'll be in Montana. Uh, we're going to have uh, the Godfather in for a couple of days. This is the last uh, day off that I'm planning. I'm assuming that I don't have any illness or any issue like that uh, between now and the election, folks. So we're going to be locked and loaded from here until Election Day. Uh, please do pass the buck. That would be uh, really greatly appreciated if you get that opportunity. Please tell somebody to download the Buck Sexton show. Uh, we see the numbers rising and it means a lot to us. And the best way that that happens, I mean, every time someone writes in and says that their friend or family member told them about the show and now they love it. One, I mean, I think that if people hear this show and are in the conservative politics space and it's the first time they hear it, our our success ratio in getting people to sign on is second to none, you know, as meaning that they want to listen to the show once they've heard about it. It's just getting the word out. There's a lot of noise out there. You know, everybody, I feel like my fifth grade science teacher's got a podcast now, so. Yeah, Buck, you have to make sure you hold the beaker at a certain angle so that it will make the little bubbles. You know, that that's a podcast you could probably listen to. All right, facebook.com slash Buck Sexton. If you want to send us a Facebook message for Roll Call, you can direct message us on Instagram, Buck Sexton, or Team Buck at iHeartMedia.com if you like to email it. That's how we do it. I will miss you all, by the way. Well, I do enjoy having a few days off and going to Montana sounds like fun. Uh, I, I do miss you all when I don't get to do the show. So there's that. I'll come back on Monday. So fired up. You guys better be ready for it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow I, it. I won't be back on Monday. Maybe you should try Tuesday. You're not. Oh, oh, yes. There's a federal holiday. Tuesday. I meant Tuesday. I forgot about that. Oh, wow. We got a real long weekend here. Yeah. It's, it's Labor Day weekend. Oh, you that's even right. Know that. Labor Day. All right. See what happens. Patrick writes the elbow thing, all caps. The elbow touch is ridiculous to me. If it is common practice to cough in your elbow rather than your hand, why are we encouraging elbow touching? You cough into your elbow, then bump elbows with someone else who likely has done the same thing recently, then bury your face back in your elbow to cough again. Keep up the great work. Shields high. Well, Patrick, I think the elbow thing is ridiculous just because it looks ridiculous. I'm not sure that... I think that people cough into the interior of their elbow and they touch the kind of pointy, bony part of the elbow. So I'm not sure that that really is a big disease transfer risk the way that you're you're seeing it. But yeah, it could be. I don't know. And I think the whole thing is, is kind of ridiculous. Um, but I do think it's probably best for adult males to get away from the like handshake and then clasp the kind of, you know, I believe you call it give someone a pound. Handshake, finger clasp, and then half hug thing. You know what I'm talking about, producer Mark? Yeah, the the bro hug. Yeah, the bro the bro hug. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think we could we could probably do better than the bro. I, I think you either shake hands or you hug. Why are we doing this hybrid bro hug thing? Because men don't like to hug. Yeah, but then you handshake. I don't I don't know. I feel like you go one or you go the other. You know. That's... I don't like handshakes either, but I'm also kind of a germaphobe, like yeah. well before COVID. I also think, you know, can you really trust an American who thinks you go for the double cheek kiss the first time you meet him? I've come across a few. I've come across a few, you know, male, female, doesn't matter. Double cheek kiss. You're like, are you is your name Francois? And did you just get here from Ile de Paris? You know, 
you have to be somebody very close to me if you're going to go in for a kiss. Right? Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I you, think. you don't do a kiss on the first meeting, too. I, I'm just telling you, man. You know, sometimes, sometimes crazy stuff happens. I know it happens, but people are weird. All right. April writes in, my husband and I lived in Livingston, Montana for almost seven years, but moved to the Grand Canyon, Arizona at the beginning of 2019. I miss Livingston and Bozeman every day, and Yellowstone is like nothing else on Earth. While in Bozeman, I highly recommend you check out kombucha at Dean's Zesty Booch Booch Tasting Room if you'd like to try something a little different to drink than cider. There's also a whiskey distillery and shops in the same complex. I think it's gluten-free, but you should ask just in case. It's definitely worth the effort. I didn't think I liked kombucha until I tried it. I'm usually all about cider since I don't like beer, but kombucha is a lot of bubbly fun. Enjoy Montana. Thank you, April. That's a great list. I'm going to take that, pass it to the Snow Princess. We're going to check it out. I think that I, I like kombucha. I've had, have you ever had kombucha, producer Mark? I have it, but I heard everyone likes it, so I'm like, I, I would try that. It's, it's it funky, good. but it's good funky. You know, it's funky, but it's good funky. I will tell you, I make one of the, my more, I don't know if it's a bougie habit or what you'd call it, but I make fresh ginger tea for myself constantly. I think it's because, well, for my throat, because I'm always speaking and my throat gets raspy and messed up. And I think the ginger and lemon together works very, very well. But, you know, the ginger root uh, is not an appealing looking thing. But if you slice it up, it, it, you, you, when you eat sushi, you know, the little pickled ginger you eat. Same idea. I don't eat that. You don't, don't eat the pickled ginger? Sushi. Yeah, no. That's disgusting. Uh, look, My extent wasa- of ginger will be ginger ale. The wasabi is like that. I don't know why people punish themselves with that. You know, wasabi, you're playing with fire. You get a little too much of that neon green goo on, uh, on your California roll or in your case, the Philadelphia roll. And, you know, it, all of a sudden it feels like someone's blown out your sinuses with a flamethrower. It's just not worth it. Yeah, I don't get how people eat that. I, I just leave it to the side of my plate. I throw it out. I don't want it. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not, not for... I mean, I, I, like, I like the uh, ginger, but I, I'm not a wasabi person at all. Jordan, what's up, Buck? I know it's cold for half of the year, but the live free or die state of New Hampshire is the obvious place to plant the Freedom Hut. No income tax, and New Hampshire was a red state until a few years ago. I'm doing everything I can to help turn the state back to red. I started a town of Portsmouth Facebook group where we own the libs and embrace free speech. I recommend all conservatives do the same. Trump 2020 shields high. Well, Jordan, um, thank you for that. Very cool. I appreciate it. That's uh, a a good wreck. A little cold for producer Mark. We don't want to give him any excuse to complain about how cold it is. So I think Florida is still Florida and Texas. Look, we're just going to keep on. We're going to create a Freedom Hut, Florida, Texas rivalry that goes on for some time until eventually I'm able to actually move and leave New York. And, and then uh, we'll see which state ends up winning. We'll do like some kind of online poll. Team Buck Florida just fights it out with Team Buck Texas, like the Sharks, Sark, uh, Sharks and the Jets. So I like thought that. my opinion was the only one that matters. Well, yeah, because of, I mean, if you know, you know, you guys know the expression, happy wife, happy life, happy producer, Mark, happy radio show. So it's yes. important that we make I'm sure. glad we've established those rules. Yeah, it's, it's important. Um, but no, New Hampshire is great. I, I was up there a few years ago to do some interviews with presidential candidates. I, uh, I like New Hampshire a lot. I, I'm going to say the, the politics are worse. I'm more of a new, I'm more of a Vermont guy by background. I spent more time in Vermont, but. You know, I could I could be convinced. I'm persuadable, and I went to college in Massachusetts, so I've spent lots of time in New England. Brian, Buck, and Mark, enjoy a well deserved break, guys. Bozeman is a great place. My buddy lives out there, and we had a rager of a wedding there years ago. You're gonna love it. I hear of crazy bidding wars, sight unseen in Montana, of people trying to escape totalitarian states and cities. Crazy times. Stay safe. P.S. Watch searching for Sugar Man already. Hmm. I will tell you, producer Mark, I convinced the Snow Princess. You know what we're going to watch on the plane? What? Mighty Ducks. Wow. Going to download it to the uh, download it to the computer, watch the Mighty Ducks on the plane. You know there's three movies, right? There are three Mighty Ducks movies? Yeah, really? You didn't know that? I did not know that. Yeah, there's the Mighty Ducks, there's D2, and there's D3. I was unaware of that. D2 is the best one, honestly. Wait, D2 is better than 
the original? My personal rankings are two, one, three. I'm going to tell you something that may blow your mind because I did look this up last night as I was looking to see where we could download and watch the movie. Do you know who stars in the original Mighty Ducks movie other than Emilio Estevez? No. Jussie Smollett. Oh, yes, I did know that, actually. Yep, that's for yeah. real, folks. He's a Jussie, minor character, yeah. Jussie Smollett is a child actor and like one of the, one of the kids that's on the uh, hockey team in the Mighty Ducks. Oh, yes. yeah. That is correct. Who knew what great heights Jussie's career would take him to later? Oh, man, that guy was great. Good thing. Good times, everybody. Good times. All right, more roll call before I uh, sign off and get ready to go and ride them, cowboy. I guess they don't say that in Montana, though. They have cowboys, but they don't do the whole like, hey, like I got spurs and a Stetson and all. But like, do they do that? I think that's more of a stereotypically Texas thing. Right, isn't it right? But but if they got cowboys in Montana. So do the cowboys in Montana have different cultural traditions than the cowboys in Texas? I don't even know. I've got to say, I wouldn't ask a cowboy. That seems like something that might anger them. Yeah, no. I mean, if they actually work with horses on, a, on, an, on an actual ranch. I don't think they'd, I don't think they'd appreciate the... Uh, yeah the New York City impression of them. Probably. Yeah, they might try to lasso you, which actually would be humorous. Maybe Snow Princess can film it for us. That's true. Speaking of which, Zach wrote in and, and said, was listening to Roll Call, heard you mention the Snow Princess again. I get confused. Is Tolu the Snow Princess or is that your girlfriend? No, Tolu is the white French bulldog who is actually my parents, but I have been taking care of her during the pandemic and now I'm somewhat inseparable from her and ask my parents all the time, uh, you know, so if I can, if I can, have her basically if I can like babysit her. Um, Snow Princess is the girlfriend, so no, no. They're, they're, one is a human, one is a lovely human, and the other is a is a delightful canine companion. Um, and there are so many names for Tallulah that we have, but I can't even say them all on the radio because you'd think that I've, I don't know, I've turned into like brain mush or something because we come up with new nicknames for her every day. Um, I do call her the Baby Seal sometimes because, uh, or just Baby Seal. Because if she's all white and she's rotund in her old age, she's 11 and she's well fed. You know, I don't want to I don't want to cut back on the treats for her. She's not obese or anything like that. She's healthy, but she's, you know, a very pleasantly plump Frenchie. And and sometimes the when she lies down, you know, because she's all white, she looks a little bit like those photos you'll see of the baby seal. Which of course, all white on the tundra or on the ice pack. When the polar bears, you know what I mean, are, are wandering around, and the seal's trying to stay low and stay out of sight. So she looks a little bit like a baby seal. See, I've already talked about this too much. James. Miss, I just want to point out to Mrs. Sexton, I had nothing to do with that comment. Yeah, no, nothing. Oh, she's going to yell at me for that one. James, she's very protective of Tallulah's uh, uh, sense, sense of her waistline. Buck, it appears that Cuomo added Montana on Cuomo's hit list since you're going to go there for a short vacation. He must listen to your show. Looks like he wants to keep you locked up at home for another two weeks. You must have offended King Cuomo. Keep up the good work. Shields High from WGY up in Albany, where I'm sure they know all about Cuomo very well. Cuomo wants to rule in New York State. What do I mean by New York State? New York State is a place where Governor Cuomo's in charge. Is that a good thing? No. Cuomo in charge means that people are going to suffer and it's going to be miserable. What do I mean by miserable? A miserable... You get the idea. Joe, Buck, I've heard you say it's Wheeler versus de Blasio for the worst mayor in America. I don't think you give Lightfoot nearly enough credit. Shields high. Joe, I, I think you raise a fair you raise a fair point. I mean, Lightfoot is pretty incredibly horrible as a mayor. But the Blasio is a whole other category. At least Lightfoot gets angry when people say that she's like not doing anything about the looters. De Blasio's like, well, I'm well, the looters. I kind of like the looters. I don't really, you know, De Blasio's the worst. The worst. But Lightfoot's bad. She's definitely in the uh if there was an Avengers of Awful for New York, I mean, for uh, American mayors, Lightfoot would definitely make the team. Anthony, Buck, someone needs to ask Biden if he'll accept the results on election night like they did to the president. Shields high. Um, yeah, I, they should ask them that. They won't ask them that, though, because of course not. Well, everybody, thank you so much for listening. Like I said, I'll be back right after Labor Day. 
Please do tune in for my man, Michael Pelica tomorrow. The next day, he's going to do a great, sh- a great job at the helm of the Freedom Hut. Uh, producer Mark and I are going to go on some R&R. We're going to come back fired up with our shields high.